Um, playing with Python bytecode, please welcome Scott and Joe. Hello. Um, all right, so hey everyone, thank you all for coming out here today. Um, I know you guys were all really excited to see Scott and Joe come here and talk about playing with Python bytecode. Um, unfortunately, I have a little bit of bad news for everyone. Uh, we just received word from Scott and Joe that they're not actually going to be able to make it today. Um, but fortunately, they sent me their outline, so they said that they were going to talk about um, CPython's internal code representation. They were going to talk a little bit about uh, creating a code object from scratch, wh whatever that means. Um, and they were going to talk about um, techniques for manipulating and updating code objects to do interesting things. So. I don't know what any of that means, but uh, they sent me their outline, and I was thinking, you know, we're here, Python's this great interactive language, maybe we can work through uh, what some of that stuff means together. Um, so, you know, if we're, if we're going to be creating and mutating functions and code objects from scratch, we probably need some functions to work with, so why don't we start with, you know, just a simple, maybe, maybe an add function. So we'll do def add of a comma b, and we'll return a plus b. And let's just call that and make sure that works. One, two. OK, so so far, so good. Um, so one of the great things about Python, right, is everything's an object. Everything's introspectable. It gives us all these great tools for working with code. Um, so you know, everything in Python just sort of carries around all of its state. So, so I'm guessing maybe the code is somewhere down here. So you know, everything secret and interesting in Python starts with a double underscore. So maybe we can find something here. Uh, under annotations, that, that's not it. Uh, under, under call, under class, under closure, under defaults, uh, byte code. Uh, all right, I don't see any byte code, but there, there is this under code attribute. So, all right, this is a code object at some memory address, and it's from file ipython input eight. Um, so the, this is probably you know where this byte code thing lives. Uh, maybe maybe we should see what else lives on this object. So okay, we've got a whole bunch of attributes. We've got uh, co arg count, which is two. Uh, we've got co uh, co co cell vars. It's an empty tuple. So I guess we don't have any cell vars. We've got co consts as a tuple containing none. So maybe, maybe none is somehow a const, or maybe this signifies that we don't have any consts. Uh, byte code. Mm, I don't see any byte code, but again, we've got this this co code attribute. Um, and it's a bytes object. So we've got co code, it's a bytes object. I'm guessing this is the byte code. So I guess the byte code for add is pipe 00, pipe 10, 17, capital S. Yeah, clearly that makes sense to everyone, right? Um, uh, all right, you know what? I got an idea. We've got this string, it's, it's full of non printing characters, right? This probably isn't meant to be interpreted as a string. Uh, maybe a better thing for us to, be, to do would be to look at the raw values of the bytes in that byte string. So I can do print. List of add dot under code dot co code. All right, this this is definitely a little more structured. Ooh, not printing things. This is definitely a little more structured, right? We've got one twenty four zero zero, one twenty four one zero. So there's kind of a repeating pattern here. Maybe this is somehow the same thing happening twice, but with different values. And then we've got a twenty three and an eighty three, which definitely means something. Um. I was really hoping this would be easier. Um, all right, you know what? I've got an idea. Um, we're here. We're at PyGotham. We're surrounded by some of the best, most knowledgeable Python programmers around. Surely there's someone here in the audience who, who knows about bytecode, who's worked with bytecode, maybe can come teach us how bytecode works. So is, is there anyone here maybe who knows about bytecode? Anybody? Well, I'm actually a PSF certified bytecode expert. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a certified bytecode expert. Can we get a microphone for him? Oh, no, no need. I brought my own microphone. Wait, you brought your own microphone? Uh, let, let's get back microphone? on track. You had the right idea looking at that uh, bytes object as a list of ints, but you're not going to get very far looking at it like that. Luckily, Python provides a module for inspecting this. Why don't you try import this? OK, import this. All right, the Zen of Python by <laughs> no, two no. Peters. No, no, import this with a D. It's oh. the disassembly module. OK, all right, import dis. All right, I've imported dis. What do I do with dis? Uh, we'll call dis.dis of add. All right, dis.dis of add. All right, well, well, that's definitely better than just a, a list of bytes values. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what this table means? Uh, sure. 
So while we have eight bytes in our bytecode, we actually only have four instructions. We have a load fast, another load fast, a binary add, and a return value. So the first three bytes, the 12400, represent the first load fast. The 12410 represents the second load fast. Then the 23 and 83 are the binary add and return value, respectively. OK, so 12400 corresponds to a single load fast instruction, but 23 and 83 correspond to binary add and return value. Why does load fast take up three bytes in the bytecode when binary add and return value only take up one? Load fast says to load a local variable, but it needs to know which local variable to load. So in the 12400, the first byte, 124, is the opcode for load fast. This tells us which operation we're going to perform. Then the 00 are the argument, which says to load local variable 0. Wait, local variable 0? Didn't, didn't we want to load A? The argument is a 16-bit little endian integer, which is an index into an array of local variables. This helps us out by showing us the numerical value of the argument on the right side there. However, it shows us the meaning of that numerical argument in parentheses. So while it is a load fast of 0, that actually means load A. OK, so 124.00 is a single load fast instruction. And then load fast of 0 actually means load the local variable A. Where exactly are we loading A to? Load instructions push values onto a stack, which is shared between instructions. This allows other instructions to manipulate these values later. If you'll notice, there's no argument in the bytecode for binary add, because it will just pop the top two values off the stack, add them together, and push the result onto the stack. OK, let me make sure I understand this. At the start of this function, we're going to have an empty stack. Then we're going to do a load fast of 0, which will load A onto the stack. Then a load fast of 1, which will push B onto the stack. Then we're going to do a binary add, which will pop both values off the stack, add them together, and push the result back onto the stack. And then finally, we're going to execute a return value instruction, which pops the top value off the stack and returns it to the calling stack frame? Exactly. OK, I think I understand the right-hand side of this table. Uh, how about these numbers to the left of the instruction names? Those are the bytecode offsets where those instructions appear. So of course, the first argument starts at index 0. However, the second instruction starts at index 3, because indices 1 and 2 are occupied by the arguments to the first load fast. OK, and then binary add appears at index 6, because indices 4 and 5 hold the argument to the second load fast instruction. OK, uh, I think I understand this side, and I think I understand this column. Uh, what's this 2 in the top left corner for? That's the line in the source file where these instructions appear. This would be a little more apparent if we try to function with more than one line. Uh, OK, how about maybe like a you know, def add with a sign. And we'll do a comma b. <laughs> and then we'll just do x equals a plus b. And then we'll return x. And then we'll do dis dot dis of add with a sign. OK, so what you're saying is that this 2 here says that the first four instructions of this code correspond to the second line of the source where we're doing x equals a plus b. And then this 3 says that the last two instructions correspond to the, last, to the third line of the source where we're doing a return x. And here we can also see that we're doing a store fast instead of a load fast to assign to x. I think you're getting the hang of this. Why don't we try a function that's a little more complicated? Um, OK, maybe, um, I don't know, like an, a an absolute value function. Um, so how about we do def abs, take a single argument x, and then we'll do if x is greater than 0, return x, else return negative x. And then we'll do dis dot dis of abs. All right, let me see if I can do this one. Uh, we've got a load fast of 0, which is going to push x onto the stack. Then we're going to do a load const. So I, I guess there's multiple kinds of load instructions in CPython. We're going to do a load const of 1, but that actually means load the value 0. Then we're going to do a compare op of 4, and that means greater than. How does CPython know that compare op of 4 means greater than? Not all arguments are just indices into some array. Here, the argument to compare op is an enum which says which relational operator to use. So there are entries for greater than, less than, or equal to. OK, and then after that, we're going to do a oh, pop jump. Hold on. If this one might be a little more complicated for you. Luckily, pop jump if false does exactly what it says it does. It's going to pop the top value off the stack. If it's truthy, it will continue execution like normal. But if it's falsy, it will jump to the bytecode offset specified in its argument, which in this case is 16. 
okay, so when we get to pop jump if false, if the top value of the stack is truthy, we're just gonna continue on executing the, the load fast and the return value. But if it's falsy, we're gonna jump to the instruction at index 16 because 16 is the argument to pop jump if false. If you'll notice, those arrows there are this is hint for the non-bytecode experts that this is a jump target. Okay. Wait a second. So if x is greater than zero, we're gonna go here and we're just gonna go straight to these two instructions. If it's less than or equal to zero, we're gonna jump here and go load fast unary negative return value. There's two instructions at, this bo at the bottom of this function that are never gonna be executed. Why are those even there? Uh, those instructions are just dead code. So CPython has a fairly simple code generation algorithm, and one of the rules is that if a function does not end in a return statement, a load const of none and a return value will be emitted for you, even if they can never be executed. That seems kind of wasteful, don't you think? It's only an extra four bytes at the end of a function, which is half a pointer. The CPython developers decided it's not worth the extra complexity to remove it. Okay, but say we really cared about those four bytes. Is there, is there some way we could remove them? Well, you don't have to use the CPython compiler. You can just instantiate a code object like any other object. Okay, well, any other Python object I instantiate by calling its constructor, right? So I need to find the constructor or, or the type for a function, I guess, or a code object. How do I, where do I find the type for a code object? That would be in the types module. Okay, from types, and what, what am I importing? Uh, code type. It is the type of code. Okay, from types, import, all right, code type. Uh, and I guess we should look at the docs to see what we do with this. So we'll do print of code type dot under doc. All right, we've got a billion arguments to this thing. Uh, and the docs say create a code object not for the faint of heart. <laughs> All right, well, well, fortunately for us, we've got a bytecode expert here to help us out. Uh, maybe we should, uh, oops. All right, maybe we should see what we wanna do here. So I, I guess we should just get started, right? So we'll do my code equals code type of, all right, the first argument is arg count. Um, well, I guess we should probably figure out what it is that we, we wanna write here first, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess we, should, we can write our own abs function, right? Uh, how about we start off with something a little more suited for you? Uh, maybe like add one? I feel like we could have done something a little bit harder than add one, but fine, okay. So add one, I guess we'll just have uh, def add one of x, and this will return x plus one. You got it. All right. Um, Whoops. Um, you know what, I'm gonna put this back one. No, I'm not. Def add one, x, return x plus one. Um, okay, and so I, I guess we probably need those code docs again. So I'll do print uh, code type, type dot under doc, uh, code type, there we go. All right, so we've got code type here, and we're gonna do my code equals code type of, okay, well, uh, arg count is gonna be uh, one, because we just have one argument. Then we've got quonely arg count. Uh, we don't have any keyword only arguments, so this is just gonna be zero. Uh, next up, we've got n locals. Well, we only have x, there's only one local variable, so that's probably just gonna be one. Uh, next up, we've got stack size. What, what's the stack size gonna be here? Uh, the stack size tells Python how much space to reserve for values on the stack. So this is the number of slots that will be, these are the slots that will be used when we push values on the stack, and it needs to be able to hold the maximum number of elements that will ever appear on the stack at any one time. Okay, well, in this function, the largest the stack is ever gonna be is right before we execute a binary add instruction when we have both x and one on the stack. So the stack size here needs to be two. Um, next up, we've got flags. What are the flags about? The flags are a bit mask holding various options that a function could have. There are many of these, so I've taken the liberty of preparing a little material ahead of time. Wait, you prepared ahead Wait, of time? Would you be so kind as to hit the down arrow on the keyboard? How did you get these uh, here? Let, let's get back on track here. So the first flag that we care about is co-optimized. Co-optimized tells the interpreter that it's free to make certain optimizations when executing this code object. 
In practice, this means that this code object comes from a function as opposed to a module or class body. The next flag that we care about is co new locals. New locals says that a new locals dictionary should be allocated every time we execute this code object. Again, this normally means that it comes from a function. Okay, I'm guessing that co var args and co var keywords tell us whether the function takes star star args or star args. Exactly. The next flag that we are interested in is co no free. Co no free says that this code object does not share any variables with any other code objects through a cell variable or a free variable. This means that this function is not a closure. Okay, and then after that, we've got co coroutine and co iterable coroutine. What's the difference between a coroutine and an iterable coroutine? These two flags were added in Python 3.5 to support the new async keyword. So a co coroutine says that this code object comes from an async def function, but co iterable coroutine is an old style coroutine which has been decorated with typestock coroutine. Okay, well, fortunately, I think that's all the flags, right? Oh, we've got more flags. These are the flags that are enabled when you use a from Dunder future import statement. For example, from Dunder future import division. Okay, I've, I've seen division, I've seen absolute import, with statement, print function. What's co future bury as BDFL? <laughs> this flag says that you've enabled enhanced inequality syntax. Obviously, okay. Um, I, I guess we can we just get back to the to that code I was writing before. Why did you? You, you see, I've selected code. the flags we need, 67. Uh, so let, let's keep going. I'm so changing all my passwords when this is over. Um, okay, so we did arg count, we did quote the arg count, and local stack size flags. Uh, next up is code string. So uh, I don't see byte code anywhere else. So I'm guessing code string is our main event here. So we're going to need a bytes object with all of the instructions that we need. Um, all right. Mr. Bytecode expert, what, what, are the, what are the instructions we're going to need here? Uh, uh, 12400, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, so first, we're going to start with 124, which is the opcode for load fast. Since we only have one local variable, we can store this at index 0. Next, we are going to load a constant, so we need the opcode 100. Again, we only have one constant, so we can store that at index 0. Finally, we're going to use 23, which is the opcode for binary add, followed by 83, which is the opcode for return value. All right, I guess that's not that bad. Um, next up, we've got constants. Uh, so uh, you said we're only going to have one const there, right? So uh, I guess this is just going to be uh, a tuple containing the value 1. Uh, next up, we've got names and var names. What's the difference between a name and a var name? Names are the names of any global variables or attributes which are referenced in this function. Since we don't have any, we can just use an empty tuple. All right, one empty tuple coming right up. Var names, on the other hand, are the names of any local variables in this function. So we can just use the tuple containing the string x. OK, got an x tuple. Uh, after this, we've uh, got. The next four don't really have much meaning for a handwritten bytecode, a uh, handwritten code object. So we're going to start with file name, which is the file where this code object comes from. We don't really have one, so just pick your favorite string. Next, we have the name, <laughs> which is the name of this code object, uh, or the name of this function. Uh, I guess that should just be add one. Yep. Then we have first line note, which is the li first line in our source file where this appears. Since we don't really have a file, we don't have a first line, so just pick your favorite positive integer. Uh, next, we have uh, LNO tab, which stands for the line number table. This is a bytes object, which is a mapping between bytecode offsets and line offsets. Since we don't care about the line information, we can just use an empty bytes object. All right, one empty bytes object. Um, and then last but not least, we've got free vars and cell vars. What's the deal with those? Those are the names of any variables that we share through cell variables or free variables. Since we don't have any and we also set Kono free, these both better be empty. All right. Two empty tuples. Um, and I guess moment of truth. Let's see if that worked. All right. Well, it didn't crash, so I guess we've got a code object. Let's, let's try calling it. So I should be able to do my code of five, and I should get... Hey, what gives? I thought you said you were some kind of bytecode expert. Uh, well, we don't normally just work with code objects now, do we? No, no, we normally work with function objects. And I bet I know what you're going to say next, which is that I can make a function object just like any other type in Python. 
which means I need to import function type from the types module. So I can do from types import function type without a string. And let's see how we call a function. Hopefully it's not as bad as code. All right, print function type dot under doc. All right, create a function object from a code object and a dictionary. All right, well, I've got a code object and I know how to make a dictionary, so I should be able to do my add one equals function type of my code and an empty dict. All right, well, that didn't crash. Uh, all right, my add one of five gives me six. This bytecode thing's not so bad. Yeah. Well, why don't you see how close you were to the one that Python gave us? Um, okay, well, uh, let's do uh, dis.dis of add one. And then we'll just print a separator so we can see the difference. And then dis.dis of my add one. Uh, all right, well, we've got some nonsense line numbers over here, but other than that, we've got load fast, load const, binary add return value, load fast, load const, binary add return value. I, I think we got it exactly correct. Well, not quite exact. You'll notice C Python uses a load fast of one. However, you are using a load fast of zero. A uh, load const, sorry. Uh, okay, that, that, that's a little interesting. Why is C Python generating a load const of one? What, what does C Python have in the const there? So let's see, print. Uh, add one dot under code dot co consts. And maybe we'll just put that compared to my add one. What, what the heck? C Python just has a none in the co consts there. Why is that there? Nothing in this function uses none. Uh, that's a little quirk of the C Python compiler. None will always appear at index zero in the consts, even if it's not referenced. Wait, so are you saying that our handcrafted, artisanal, non-GMO bytecode is even more sleek and well-optimized than what CPython itself generates? In a way that does not matter at all. I don't know. That, that none might be the difference, you know. Um, <laughs> wait a second. So if CPython is just reading values out of this co-consts tuple, what happens if I just, like, update it in place? Like, what if I do my add one dot co consts equals two. Uh, sorry, dot donor code dot co consts. That just would have said an attribute. All right, what, what gives? Why, what, I, why can't I do that? Well, I mean, let's imagine for a second you did do that. Anyone who had a reference to my add one now just got a reference to my add two which is probably not what they wanted. I don't know, myAd2 sounds like a great function. <laughs> Though I guess I, I could imagine how you might want your consts to actually be constant. So does that mean there's no way for us to like create or update or change around a code object that we already have? Well, we can't mutate it in place, but we can always just make a new one by copying all the attributes from another code object and swapping out any values we wish to change. Okay, so you're saying that what we need is like, a function that does a functional update on a function. <laughs> okay, I, I think I can write that. Uh, we, you've already so written it. So I went ahead and wrote this one for you. It's pretty long, you know, a little complicated. Honestly, you probably get it wrong. <laughs> All right, fine, you know, ignoring that. Okay, so this is, it says function that performs a functional update on a function. So what update is gonna do is it takes a function f, it's gonna grab its dunder code, and then what it's gonna do is create a new code object, passing all the attributes of the old code object, but swapping out any that were passed by keyword directly to this function. So now we're gonna have a new code object that swapped out any attributes that were provided, and then we're gonna pass that into a function type and copy the globals and the name and all the other attributes of the code object. Of the function object. Right. Okay, so uh, what you're saying is that if I do update of my add one with co consts equals the tuple containing two, then that should give me my add two. And then if I do my add two of five, I get seven. Hey, this bytecode thing's not that bad. I think we're all well on our way to becoming well, certified yeah, bytecode yeah, experts. That, that's cute and all, but you can only get so far updating the metadata. 
The real meat of the code object is in the bytecode itself. Well, co-code is just another attribute of the bytecode, right? So if I can swap out co-cons with a new tuple, I can swap out co-code with some new code. Now you're cooking with gas. What if we wrote a function that swapped out all the 23s with 20s? Wait, 23s and 20s? Oh, binary heads with binary multiplies. I forget we're not all bytecode experts. <laughs> OK. Um, so what you're saying is what I need is some sort of like def add to mul, which is going to take a function f. And then I want to grab the co-code off this. So it'll be old equals f dot dundercode dot co-code. And then what I want to do is replace all the bytes in this code object with a value of 23 with a new byte with a value of 20. So I'm going to do new equals old dot replace bytes of 23 with bytes of 20. And then what I want to do is invoke update to swap out that code on our function. So we want to do return update of f with co code, code equals new. And now if I do add to mul of my add to, I'm going to get my mul to. And if I do my mul to of 5, I get 10. See, this bytecode hacking stuff isn't so hard when you know how everything works. <laughs> you know. I think there's actually a bug in this code generation algorithm you gave me. Uh, no, I, I don't write bugs. I mean, how could there be a bug here? We just swapped out all the binary adds with binary multiplies. Well, no. We swapped out all the bytes with a value of 23 with bytes with a value of 20. And you told me mere moments ago that not every byte in the bytecode is an instruction. Some of them are arguments. I mean, 23 means binary add. Like, there's no way a 23 byte would ever uh, appear as an argument, <laughs> right? Well, what if we had a function with 23 local variables? No one's going to write a function with 23 local well, variables. Well, now that you mention it, I actually have a function right here <laughs> that has 26 local variables. So th this is my get x function. I use this all the time at work. Uh, <laughs> And this function, you pass it the alphabet, and it gives you x back, right? So if I do <laughs> get x, and I star unpack ASCII lowercase, which is just a string containing all the variables in the alphabet, if I do ASCII lowercase, then I get x. And this function's not doing any fancy you know, addition or multiplication or anything you know, crazy like that. I'm just returning a local variable. So add to mul shouldn't have any effect on get x, right? It should be a no op. But x is the, is the variable at index 23 in the alphabet. So that means that if I do add to mul of get x, it's going to turn it into get u. <laughs> and you know, this actually could have been a lot worse, I think. I mean, at least here, 20 was still a valid index for us to load. What even would have happened if we had loaded a local variable at an index that didn't even exist? Like, or, or a constant, right? Like, what if I did, uh, you know, update of my add one with co consts is an empty tuple? That would turn add one into some sort of like my bad one. And if I call my bad one of five, ooh, <laughs> yeah. I think you may have seg faulted the interpreter there. Uh, you, you know, uh, now, now that you mention it, th there may be some issues with that jump code I showed you before. Like, if we're just jumping to the bytecode offset specified in the argument, what if that's not a valid op like instruction? Or what if that's out of bounds entirely? Who knows what would happen? Hey, yeah, and, and since jump offsets are just some offset into the bytecode, that means they'll always be wrong if we ever like insert or delete an instruction. They'll all they'll all be the wrong indices, right? Yeah. We would need some way to like recalculate them. That seems like a lot of work. Yeah. This bytecode hacking thing seems harder than I thought. Hey, hey, didn't you say that Joe and Scott had worked on a library that that should help transform code objects like this? Uh, oh yeah. 
Code Transformer. I, I actually downloaded it right before the talk. I was hoping you know, maybe we get to look at it a little bit. Uh, maybe they have some ideas for solving some of these problems. Um, so we can do you know, from Code Transformer. Oops, from Code Transformer dot, okay, well, let's see what they've got in here. They've got a Code class, they've got a Code Transformer class. Makes sense. Code, core, decompiler, match, patterns. Tests. They've got tests. Um, all right, transformers. That, that's probably where the meat is, right? So let's see, import. Uh, Joe and Scott wrote add to mull. I guess great minds think alike. I'm, I'm sure this is one of the most useful transformers in Code Transformer, right? All right, so let's see how we use add to mull. No, oh, I, I guess it's a module where they're defining the actual add to mull transformer. So maybe, maybe we should go look at the source and see how that works. Um, okay, so add to mull, a transformer that replaces binary add instructions with binary multiply instructions. This isn't useful, but it's good introductory or example. Uh, you know what, uh, we're gonna agree to disagree there. Um, okay, so we're saying from code transformer, import code transformer and pattern, and then from code transformer.instructions, we're importing binary add and binary multiplier. So we've got some sort of code transformer base class, we've got some notion of pattern matching, and then we have some sort of objects that represent instructions. That seems a lot nicer than just memorizing 23 and 20 all over the place. For some. <laughs> okay, and then in this add to mold class, we're subclassing code transformer, and then we're decorating a replace add with multiply method with a pattern of binary add, and it's yielding a binary multiply. So it looks like what's happening here is we're registering methods that match certain patterns of instructions, and then we're writing generators that yield replacements for those instructions. So this is gonna match a pattern of a single binary add and yield a replacement of a single binary multiply. What do you think that steal method does? Uh, well, through the magic of Emacs, we can say. Okay, steal is steal the jump index off of instr. This makes anything that would have jumped to instr jump to this instruction instead. So this looks like it's some sort of technique for dealing with that jump offset resolution problem that we talked about a second ago. Yeah. Okay, well, if they don't think add to mole is, is you know, a useful transformer, maybe we should see what kinds of transformers they do have here. Um, okay, well, we've got as constants, byte array literals, decimal literals, Haskell strings. Uh, order dict literals, that, that sounds kind of interesting. So I think I read in the docs that you're supposed to use these as decorators, so I do at order dict literals, and then we'll say def make dict of a, b, c, comma b, comma c, and then we'll just return a dict uh, mapping a to a, b to b, and c to c. And I need to actually map that to c. <laughs> All right, and then we'll return make dict of one, two, three. And hey, look at that, I, I get an ordered dict instead of a regular dict there. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, th I think we probably have time for, for maybe one or two more. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, as constants. Uh, uh, do maybe interpolated strings. Oh, well, you know, everyone's super excited about the F strings that are coming out in Python 3.6. Maybe this is something like that. So let's see, if we do at interpolated strings, and we'll do def make stir a, b, c. And we'll just return a string mapping a, b, and c. And you know, normally this would just give me the string back, right? But then I have to actually call that. So if I do make stir of one, two, three. Hey, look at that, it just interpolated those strings in magically for me. That seems, I don't know, I still kind of like add to mole, but that seems pretty cool. Um, well, I think that's just about all the time uh, we have here today. So uh, I want to just sort of, I guess, recap what we talked about, right? So we, we talked about uh, the code object and all the attributes of the code object and you know, sort of CPython's internal code representation. Um, I guess we talked about how to create a code object from scratch. Um, we talked about some techniques for modifying code objects, but we also saw sort of the dangers of playing God with the CPython compiler in that way. Um, and then at the end here, maybe we saw some techniques for mitigating some of those dangers. Um, so I want to thank my assistant here who came up with no notice of any kind. It was just sort of gracefully helping me through this presentation. Uh, I know you guys were excited to see Joe and Scott, but you know, may, I hope you all learned something here and we all sort of got, became better programmers together. So thank you all for coming out. Uh, 
Um, so in case you haven't figured it out by now, uh, I'm Scott. And I'm Joe. Um, we wrote a library called Code Transformer for doing these kinds of terrible bytecode manipulation hacks. Um, we think it's sort of a fun and whimsical talk, or topic, and so we wanted to do a fun and whimsical talk that sort of reflected the spirit of the project. Um, so a little bit more about uh, us. Uh, we work at a startup in Boston called Quantopian that builds uh, tools for anyone to do uh, algorithmic trading in the browser in Python. Uh, we do not use any of the techniques you just saw to trade other people's real money. Or, or anywhere else in the stack, for that matter. Yeah. Um, you can find us both on GitHub. I'm github.com slash s sanderson. And I'm a, a barcode, which what, what some people dislike. What Joe means by that is that he's github.com slash 10 lowercase l's. Um, and then on Twitter, you can find me at the, again, very reasonable name of at Scott B. Sanderson. And I'm Dunder Qualman. Um, so we actually do have a, a little bit more time to uh, talk about some of the, the transformers we just showed. Um, so I was just going to run briefly through uh, a couple more interesting transformers. Um, Out of character this time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we saw the sort of simplest possible transformer. And the idea here is, again, that uh, it's sort of unsafe and dangerous, and there's various pitfalls to trying to arbitrarily manipulate and swap out and mutate code objects. So a better idiom is often to try to have a notion of sort of pattern matching and replacement. So the idea here is we want to match against certain patterns of instructions and yield replacements for them or do whatever other kinds of transformations. So the simplest case is just match a single instruction, yield a single replacement, but we can do more interesting things. Um, so an example of that is um, the as constants transformer. Um, so what this transformer does is makes it so that certain name lookups that would be globals are instead read as constants. So the reason you might want to do this is uh, if you're just in normal Python, right, and you do like load def. Up. Load up the font. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, is that OK for everybody? Mm -hmm. Cool. Right, so in, in normal Python, right, if you do like def foo, or actually I'll do percent this def foo, oops, return len of. Four spaces. Thank you, Mr. Bytecode expert. Right, if I just like return you know, the length of an empty tuple or something like that. Um, you'll notice that the instruction that's loading len here is a load global. And load global amounts to at least one dictionary lookup and sometimes two. If it's not in the globals, it falls back, back to the built-ins, which is not an enormous cost. And almost all Python code should not care about this fact. But if you're truly in a you know, deep nested loop in the bottom of your stack, you might actually care about the difference between like an array index and a hash lookup. Um, and so a thing that you'll actually see in like the CPython uh, source and in like very deep inner loops is you'll see hacks that look like this, where they say underscore len equals len and then it'll call like underscore len here instead. And the reason you do this is that default arguments are evaluated at uh, function creation time here, and so this will actually capture len as a local variable instead of a global. And so now if we look at the disassembly for this, you'll notice that we're loading len with a load fast instruction instead of a, a load global, and that's a slightly faster operation. We're doing an array index instead of a hash lookup. Um, but this is sort of a gross hack, right? Like we've added an argument to this function that we never actually want to use. We don't want it to be passed. We're just doing it because we, we care about performance in this weird way. So um, an alternative thing that you might want to do if that's too hacky for you um, is something like this. So you can decorate a function with as constants, and you can either give it a string, which is the name of a built-in, or you can also pass keywords here that says as constants a equals 1. And then if we call a, even if it's not in scope, it'll still resolve to 1. And if we actually rebind it in the outer scope, it'll still resolve to 1. And it's as though that's just a constant there. Um, and so the thing that we want to do for this transformer is replace various kinds of load instructions. There's actually about five different kinds of loads. So there's load name, load global, load deref, load class deref. There's actually another one, load fast, which by construction we don't have to care about here, but that's for completeness. There's another one. Um, and so here's a slightly more interesting pattern where we're using pipe to mean or. So we're saying match the pattern of a load name or a load global or a load deref or a load class deref. And then what we're doing is saying, if uh, the instruction is not one of our constants, we're just yielding it. And if it is, then we're replacing the, uh, the load that CPython emitted with a load of our constant value. Um, so this is an example of sort of a slightly more complex pattern. And then Joe is going to talk about one more uh, sort of complete uh, example. So this is literals, right? Yeah. So uh, this is 
uh, a special, or this is the more general case of that overloaded, uh, or that ordered dict literals one we saw, which is this is a transformer that lets you essentially register a function to be called whenever a dict literal or a dict comprehension appears in source. Yeah. Um, and the interesting piece of this is how it handles comprehensions. So while well, we only showed a static dictionary uh, display or literal, we also handle comprehensions. Um, and we need to do that in, in, in an interesting way. So here we've got a much more complicated pattern than the ones we've seen before. Uh, the important note is that we're actually matching more than a single instruction at a time. So before, we only ever cared about see, when I see this one instruction, I emit a new instruction. But this one is when I see a build map followed by a match any of var, which match any says match any type of instruction. And then the subscript var means uh, zero or more of this. Um, so I say, when I see build map, and then any amount of instructions, and then a map add, then this is telling me that I'm in the construct for a dictionary comprehension. Uh, where dictionary comprehensions look like a build map, um, which creates an empty dictionary on the stack, then a for loop, basically, where I iterate over my sequence, and then I end with a map add to write that value into the dictionary. Yeah, so we're, we're not going to talk about all the stuff that's happening here to make that work, but yeah. the interesting thing here is we're yielding a bunch of replacement instructions, and then at the end here we call self.begin in comprehension. So we don't always just care about a single pattern, because sometimes we need to know what happened before. So we actually, uh, this pattern is based uh, kind of on like Flex or Alex, if anyone's used that, where you can enter a new start code which says that some patterns are only valid given some context. So here, when we've matched this construct, we know we are now in a dictionary comprehension. So we begin the incomprehension state. And then you'll notice the next pattern is a simple pattern again. It says, I only match return values. However, there's this extra piece of information that says, I only match return values if the current state is incomprehension. And this is a, a simple thing. It just alters how we return from a comprehension based on how we rewrote the comprehension above. But what this means is that we can concisely express that we want to alter return values in the inner code object of a comprehension, but we don't want to make that transformation happen to return values of functions which use comprehensions. Um, yeah, so uh, I think we still have a couple minutes left for... Okay, so that's the end of what we actually had prepared to talk about. So for real now, uh, thank you all for coming out, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Are there any questions? Um, so the question is, if you are to do bytecode hacking, how would you go about testing it? Um, so the, the, the big concern when you're testing your code is that failure is not often an exception. Failure is often uh, an invalid ref count somewhere, which will lead to a seg fault in the interpreter or in invalid memory access. So in terms of testing, I mean, code transform itself is tested often by uh, we write out basically what the transformation is. Either we say these are the new instructions we expect, or um, more frequently, this is just what we expect to happen. Um, I don't have a good answer for how should you test in the face of uh, how do I make sure that the ref count is still the same? So you could maybe use C types to grab things like, well, actually, you can get ref count right from in Python, sys.get ref count. Um, but you have different failure modes, and I don't really have a good answer for that. But I mean, I think the short answer for that is you test it the same way that you would test anything else. Like a transformer here is just saying, all right, if I decorate this function with interpolated strings, then the strings should get interpolated in. Um, and you know you can go through some more interesting ones. But uh, it's not fundamentally different, except that when it's bad, it fails in a nastier way. Right, I'm more wondering about what, what is the end user? Yeah, so the, the, the big one is like make sure you're jumping to real things, like yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, the silent one that you won't notice for a long time 
is if you do a, a load instruction, but your stack is empty, the way the memory is actually laid out is it's the local variables, then the stack. So if your stack is empty, it will load the local variable, which will pop it from the stack, and it will dec ref it. But if that happens to have enough ref counts, you'll get that value back, but it will have a deficit of one ref count. And you won't notice until maybe even interpreter shutdown, where you'll get a seg fault tearing down some totally unrelated module. And that is very painful to debug. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Uh, can you, okay. can, what are the practical uses of this, do you feel? Like, can you use it for optimizing code, or is it just sort of like a whimsical thing, like you said? Um, so there, it's definitely, you, do you, want, you can talk yeah. about the debugger case. So I have seen a, a particularly interesting use case of bytecode hacking. Uh, it didn't use Code Transformer. Uh, we have a version of it in Code Transformer. But the idea was they used Pyrocyte to inject code into a running server process. And then they set a breakpoint in a function by injecting a load const to sys dot uh, set break or pdb dot set trace, and then a, a call function. So um, that's pretty cool because it meant that they could just like go onto their server box, set a breakpoint in their route, hit the endpoint, get the breakpoint, and then when they're done, they can just remove the breakpoint. Like the bytecode's fine, your your app is still running as normal. Uh, the reason I think that's a reasonable case is because it's debugging and it should go away. Um, <laughs> The, the risk with all this is that it's extremely version dependent, as in 3.4 to 3.5 changes. And there's even no guarantee that like 3.4.3 to 3.4.4 .4 could be the same. So you, for debugging, again, it's only ephemeral. Like it, once your process is done, it doesn't matter. But f in terms of actual production code, you have to really worry about like the very specific version you're on. Yeah, so, so one thing to think about there is we, there's a joke earlier where we talk about, you know, everyone who had add one suddenly got add two. That's actually a case where that's what you want, right? Because one of the issues with monkey patching is if people don't refer to something as an attribute of an object, they just, they've closed over it and you can't patch it out. So if you patch the bytecode, there is really no, way, no escape for them, for better or worse, right? The, you, have, you have monkey patched the only thing that they have. Oh. Um, another example of that, which is not quite in this vein, but it's sort of an example in the same theme, is um, there's a project um, from Continuum called Numba, which uh, is sort of in the same theme as this. So here, right, we were taking out bytecode, we were swapping out instructions, we were doing other things with those instructions. Numba sort of takes that to the logical extreme and says, take the Python bytecode, throw it in the trash, and replace it with LLVM intermediate representation. And it uses that in service of doing like uh, optimized numerical code. So that's not obviously using this, but that's another example where you can sort of use Python to write code that, that you can then compile into not Python, into something else, but Python's sort of a nice description language for another actual execution language. If you're worried about performance, number is really nice, so take a look. Yeah. Uh, just to repeat to everyone here, the question was, are there two to the 16 minus one uh, as a limit for local variables or global variables? So for global variables, the load global instruction takes an index into the uh, tuple containing all of the names which are referenced, and then it does a hash lookup. So you can have more global variables that you can't reference. Uh, there's an argument or an instruction we did not talk about called uh, extended arg. So what extended arg is, is it's an opcode followed by two arguments. But all that does is tell the interpreter to accumulate these two bytes and hold it like in an accumulator register. And then when it reads the next instruction, it will uh, either prepend or append those two bytes to create a four byte integer. And you can chain those so that you can use more and more. Um, so there's actually a test in Code Transformer for a function, uh, not with arguments, but with lines uh, <laughs> because of the way the LNO tab works. But. Yeah, if you want to see some like truly strange, odd corner cases of Python, look at the Code Transformer test suite. Uh, we got five minutes still. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Where do we go to learn more about this? Um, so Code Transformer has pretty decent docs. Um, go. What is it? Uh, oh, I guess we didn't say the project is hosted on GitHub. Uh, yeah. It is available as free software. Um, and it's on my GitHub, 10 lowercase l slash code transformer. Uh, there's also uh, code transformer that read the docs.io. We talk about um, many of the problems we talked about today, uh, specifics of the instructions themselves. So that's a good place. A wonderful resource is um, the disassembly modules docs. 
So that will actually tell you what all the instructions do. So for any given version, you go to like the Python official docs slash uh, dis or whatever, and there's a, just a list of all the instructions. Some of them are like okay, some of them are really good, um, some of them are incorrect, but um, that's a pretty good resource. Um, there's a bunch of comments in the interpreter loop itself that if you really care, like our, that's the best, that's the source of truth also. So that's in the C Python code base slash Python slash cval dot C. And there's a function called pi eval underscore eval frame ex. Uh, and there's a big um, switch case that uses compute to go to that's really uh, quite clear to read, actually. You would think it'd be really scary. It's just says like target of binary add, and then there's a brace, and it's like pop the value off the stack, pop the value off the stack, and push the add, the sum. So uh, that's a pretty good resource, also. Okay. So Code Transformer came because I wrote a project called Lazy Python which I wrote a wrapper object called uh, Thunk, which takes a uh, lambda and star args and star star quarks. Is it lazy Python? Yeah, lazy underscore Python. Uh, and so that project would allow me to defer computations and then uh, parse them back out, uh, substitute expressions, or just evaluate them uh, in a non-eager way. So in doing that, I had it working just fine, where the thunk object was pervasive and like it overrode every single attribute and the buffer protocol and all the every slot that you can put in a type in C. But I couldn't change is. So if I said A is B and they were both like a very common pattern is I say like if A is none, do something. But none was going to be the actual value none, and A is a computation which will evaluate to none. So they're not the same memory address. So what I needed to do is find a way to change that, and that's an operator you can't overload. So in looking at that, I said, how do, how do is uh, expressions get compiled? And it actually is a compare op instruction. So I said, all right, I need to swap that out with a function call. And then I started doing just like byte swapping, and it seg faulted constantly. So I abstracted that. Then Scott said, that's yeah. useful. <laughs> uh, pull that out of the project and make it its own thing. Yeah, and then I got involved after that. Um, the main thing that I've worked on a bunch is that we didn't talk about at all is there's a, uh, a decompiler that is attempting to add support for taking arbitrary Python bytecode and uh, inferring what the AST and ultimately what the source was. One possible application of that would be in service of allowing uh, runtime, rep uh, runtime access to the AST of your running uh, projects. So you could do sort of macro style things. So you can. You can do that if you have source right now, right? If you have a function, you can go find your file, you can go find your line number and go parse it. But if you're in a dynamically generated function or a dynamically generated piece of something else, there's no way for you to, at runtime, reliably get access to the AST of your code. So, Or you might chirrut, and then you can't load the file anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to say another example of uh, that the binary operator is actually uh, exception match. It turns out to be compiled essentially the same way as greater than, less than, or equal to. Um, so there's a transformer that overrides that, so you can pattern match against exception values instead of uh, exception type. So if anyone's ever tried to catch an OS error, for example, but you only wanted one error now, um, this lets you do that. So you can catch value error of buzz instead of just value error. All right, all right well, uh, thank you guys all for coming out. Thank you.